Sitting in prison gives you a lot of time to think about your own stupidity. However, I thought of nothing but hatred. I reflected on hating my boss, my soon-to-be ex-wife Carol, and hating myself for being so damn stupid. My name is Michael Arnold, and when I say that, I was stupid. I mean stupidity. I was stupid. Like that ignorant husband who didn't know his wife was cheating on him. And she cheated on him with the person I hated most in my life, my boss Jacob Sanders. I was also stupid because I didn't know that this traitor was pregnant with his child. Foolishly, I thought the child was mine. I think my wife's pregnancy is what sparked the conversation. Honey, we need to talk. I guess I should back up a bit and explain everything. Oddly enough, my current problems began in first grade. I first came to know and ultimately hate Jacob Sanders when we were in first grade together. We've been enemies ever since he made fun of my freckles. This was the first of many fights. It ended in a draw when the teacher separated us. I had a bloody nose and he had a black eye. For the first eight years of school, Jacob and I fought on average about three times a year, with third grade being the worst. We had seven fights. However, in eighth grade, we only had one fight, for a good reason. I wanted nothing to do with Jacob and tried to stay away from him, but he wouldn't leave me alone. For some reason, he was jealous of me and constantly tried to outdo me. He tried to get better grades than me in each of our classes. He was better in science and literature. I was better in math and history. In other subjects, we were approximately the same. In sports, Jacob was a good athlete, but I was a little better. However, if I played a sport, Jacob would play the same and try to beat me. The fighting stopped, as I said, after eighth grade, when Jacob realized he couldn't beat me. Then he started trying to embarrass me or get me into trouble. Because of him, I was almost expelled and arrested while we were in school. It was during my sophomore year that someone broke into the school and painted the hallways. The authorities found my student ID next to an empty can in a trash container. The only thing that saved me was that the day before, I noticed my ticket was missing from my wallet and reported it. I knew it had to be Jacob because one day I was getting out of the shower and saw him walking away from my locker after practice. I decided that he was up to something and checked everything in the locker. When I got to my wallet, I checked the cash first and then looked at everything else. And then I noticed that my ticket was missing. I immediately went to the office and reported this. Somehow, Jacob ended up with a fart horn. He placed the device on the desk I was sitting at and turned it on. The sound of a fart echoed through the classroom and then Jacob began to hold his nose and wave his hand. Mike, what did you have for lunch? He chuckled. The class laughed, but I used the good old trick. Whoever confessed is the one who shit himself. The class erupted in more laughter, prompting Miss Wormwood to warn us that if Jacob and I continued to disrupt the classroom, we would end up in detention. The fact that the teacher laughed at use and then scolded use made Jacob furious. He blushed but didn't say anything. Besides the fact that Jacob was trying to get me expelled and possibly even arrested, his attempts were more annoying than anything else. By and large, I didn't care that he was better than me. Other than the usual teenage insecurities, I was quite comfortable with who I was. However, there was one area that concerned me, and that was the girls. We were both pretty cute. However, Jacob's family was wealthy, which gave him an advantage over the girls at school. In the 11th grade, he got his own car, and it was not an old jalopy. His parents bought him a BMW Z4. The car cost $50,000. How could I compete with her? As it turns out, I was attractive enough to get my share of dates. On the other hand, Jacob dated cheerleaders and crowd girls. I reasoned that they were out of my league anyway, so I didn't care. However, he was not satisfied with his brilliant success with the girls. He should have tried to rub my nose in his success. If I dated a girl more than once, Jacob would jump in and start dating her. And it didn't take long for her to leave me. But even then, for the most part, I didn't care. I wasn't close to any of the girls, so if they wanted to date Jacob, it wasn't a problem for me. However, there was one girl that I really liked. Her name was Sandy Springer, and she was smart, funny, and beautiful. So when I started dating her, I took her to out-of-the-way places so Jacob wouldn't know I was interested. After several months of dating, we decided to date together. I thought that 
If Sandy wore my ring, then I was safe. Remember, I mentioned I was stupid. I was stupid then, too. Prom was approaching, and I decided that Sandy and I would go together. I should have asked her straight away, but I'm not sure it would have done any good. Anyway, after I bought the tickets, I mentioned it to Sandy at lunch. She blushed and said that she accepted Jacob's invitation to go with him. Then I demanded and received my ring back. Then he left Sandy crying in the cafeteria. I didn't talk to her anymore. I was so angry at Sandy that I wanted to rip someone's head off. Instead, I saw Pam Taylor, captain of the cheerleading team, and Jacob's supposed girlfriend. Under normal circumstances, I would never have dared to approach her. Hi, Pam, I said cheerfully. How are you? I'm fine. What about you, Michael? She answered. Pam was great and she wasn't stuck up. I'm fine, I said, deciding that I had nothing to lose. Tell me, would you like to go to prom with me? That's very kind of you, she replied kindly. But I'll go with Jacob. Oh, I pretended to be ignorant. I must have misunderstood because I just heard Jacob ask Sandy Springer. I guess I misunderstood. Yeah, forget what I said. I'm sure I misheard. I left Pam flustered and talking to herself. I later found out that he and Jacob had a big fight. He may have stolen Sandy from me, but I ruined his romance with Pam. It wasn't completely satisfying, but it was better than nothing. But later that day, things got much better. Michael, Pam called out to me as I left the school. Hi, Pam. I continued to feign innocence. I'm sorry I upset you then. Don't talk nonsense, Michael. Pam's eyes narrowed. I found out that you were dating Sandy, and that bastard Jacob stole your girlfriend. My ears were burning red. I found out. Yes, I'm sorry. I was just trying to get back at Jacob. I'm sorry you got caught in the crossfire. Are you seriously planning on taking me to the ball? Well, little bear, I began to say. Don't worry about it. Yes, I will be very happy if I can take you to graduation. Good, because I want payback, Pam said. And if you play your cards right, it could be a very memorable evening. The prom was a real event for me. Not only did I get the opportunity to ask the most beautiful girl in school to the prom, but she made me feel like a prince. Pam was all ears. I enjoyed the expressions on the other guys' faces. They couldn't believe she was there with me. And Jacob, I don't know what he thought was going to happen, but it definitely wasn't his girlfriend dating me. I think Jacob thought Pam might go to prom as one of the football players' dates, but definitely not with me. His eyes almost popped out of his head when he saw us enter the hall. Throughout the evening, he tried to get between Pam and me. He tried to get her to leave me and sit at his table. Pam blew him off. He asked her to dance many times, but Pam didn't give him the chance. I felt really bad for Sandy because she realized that Jacob was using her. Eventually, Sandy burst into tears and asked her parents to take her. I still feel a little bad, but she made her choice and had to live with it. After the ball, Jacob was still trying to get Pam away from me. I was smart enough to know that I was playing the role of Cinderella, and by tomorrow, Pam would most likely be back with Jacob. But today, I was going to play my part to the end, and that led me to a local motel where I had sex with the most beautiful girl in school. When I dropped Pam off, she gave me a big kiss and told me what a great guy I was. I went home floating on a cloud. But as I expected, by the following Monday, Pam and Jacob were a couple again. Still, I smirked at Jacob every time we passed in the hallway. Graduation arrived and most of us headed off to our colleges. I was sad to leave my hometown and scared of the unknown, but I didn't regret leaving Jacob forever, or at least that's what I thought. I was accepted into Georgia Tech while Jacob was going to Harvard. Of course he was going to Harvard. His grandfather had a building there named after him. I did well at Georgia Tech, majoring in software engineering, and it was at a party during my freshman year that I met Carol. I won't bore you with the details of how we courted, fell in love, and got married. To tell the truth, I think that in the beginning we were more like good friends than truly in love. Needless to say, our history was not that memorable, and even now none of this matters. What I will say about Carol is that she was smart. She studied business at the University of Georgia. I liked her because she was not only smart, 
but also funny and very friendly. However, Carol was not super beautiful. She was pretty, like the girl next door. Truth be told, Carol couldn't compare to Pam, but she was about as beautiful as Sandy. For some reason, we clicked. We got married three months after graduating from university, and during the five years of marriage, I considered us quite happy. Although at the time of our marriage, we were more friends than lovers, by the third year of our union, I was completely in love with Carol, and I think she was just as in love with me. We even talked about starting a family. Little did I know that my wife kind of rushed into it and started it without me. Right after graduating from school, I got a job at Zaba Security Software, a small startup company. I graduated at the top of my class, so I had my choice of jobs. The two brothers from Zaba sold me on the promise that I would be on the executive floor and make a fortune. However, don't get me wrong, the company was doing very well. The firm prospered and we did quality work for some very large companies. I was also paid a tidy six-figure salary. Our job was to find security holes in the company's software and plug them. Our reputation grew, but then the brothers decided to pay us off. To my surprise, we were acquired by a company roughly the same size as Zaba. And that's when my problems began. About three years after I started working at Zaba, Carol wanted a new job. It so happened that Zaba was looking for an office manager. Carol applied and was hired. I was a little worried that we would both be working for the same company. But at first everything went well. We went by car and had lunch together. We worked in completely different departments and areas, so we rarely saw each other during the day. We drove to work together, kissed and went to our departments. If we were both free, which was most often, we would have lunch together and go home at the end of the day. Everything was fine until everything went wrong. I was a senior programmer, which meant that I worked on projects myself and monitored the schedules of the other eight programmers who reported to me. But my main responsibility was to fix any problems that my team couldn't handle on their own. Fortunately, there were few such problems, which meant that our customers were very happy. Our workspace was the size of half a basketball court. We called it bullpen and worked mostly at standing desks. The room was filled with all kinds of computers, servers, interfaces, and printers. We had almost all the computer equipment you could want. We took pride in making our customers' systems as secure as possible. In the five years I've been with the company, we've only had one complaint where a customer's system was hacked but we traced the hack to one of the company's employees. It disabled most of the software we had installed. This employee was not very smart, but he gave us a sleepless night. In addition to the nine of us, we had an administrative assistant, Kimberly. She was like our girl Friday. She prepared any correspondence or memos we needed. She kept track of our supplies and made sure we never ran out of anything. Kimberly also prepared our monthly reports and kept track of our hours. Oddly enough, most of our work was initially done with pencil and paper. This allowed the programmer to get a general idea before he started typing anything into the computer. Somehow, Kimberly managed to decipher everyone's handwriting and type out notes for our files. Even though it wasn't her job, Kimberly made the best coffee for us every morning. Kimberly was about 23 or 4 years old, I guess. She had short blonde hair, deep hazel eyes, a very pretty face, but she was about 50 pounds overweight. Considering that Kimberly was only 5 feet 5 inches tall, this was a lot of weight for her. Even though she had a beautiful face, her big belly and backside immediately ruined the image. I knew Kimberly was sensitive about her weight because she always talked about how fat she was. I felt bad every time she did this, but I knew it was just her defense mechanism. All I cared about was that Kimberly was damn good at her job and a valuable asset to my team. It was a surprise that Zaba was acquired. The two Zaba brothers did not even have the courage to personally inform the employees about this. They asked their lawyer to make the announcement. I was furious because all the stock options that the brothers had promised when they went public were gone with that announcement. Besides, I didn't know what to do with these changes. Carol was as upset and confused by the news as I was, but she was the one who convinced me to stick with it until we saw what the new owners would do. 
they sent a senior vice president to oversee the transition process. At first, he concentrated on the main office. Zaba has grown from five employees when I joined to more than 150. From what I hear, the person at the new corporate headquarters will start in accounting. Then, he was going to make his way through the entire company. It wasn't until the second day that I learned that the vice president reviewing Zaba security software was none other than Jacob Sanders. However, at the same time, I learned that Jacob was leading the transition. I learned that our pay scale would be aligned with that of the parent company. My salary will be increased by $35,000, and Carol's salary will be increased by $15,000. My internal alarm signal told me to run rather than go to the nearest exit. However, Carol convinced me that we would be foolish to leave our current jobs, especially after the salary increase. Besides, she noted, Jacob would only work there for six months before leaving. The first change occurred when four new programmers were hired and assigned to the bullpen. Sure, they were all Harvard people, but none of them were a tenth better than anyone on my existing team. They were not only lousy programmers, but also arrogant and with a sense of their own superiority. All four of them immediately began to harass Kimberly. Sometimes it was sexual harassment, and sometimes it was just meanness. I tried to reassure them and point out that their behavior was unacceptable. However, they didn't stop. Instead, they just harassed Kimberly when they thought I wasn't around. Finally, I called all four of them into the conference room and read them the riot act. They listened to me, but I saw that they were not going to stop. Besides harassing Kimberly, all four of them were a pain in the ass. Nobody on my team liked them, and they did more harm than good when it came to their work. Eventually, I decided I wanted them to leave. Unfortunately, I didn't have the authority to fire them because Jacob hired them. I knew that if I demanded that he fire them, Jacob would simply ignore me. I knew that Kimberly came early every day to make coffee and prepare the office. Ever since I told off those four idiots for their treatment of Kimberly, I noticed that they all started coming earlier. Eventually, I realized that they were using the time before I arrived to torture the poor girl. It turned out that Kimberly was getting to the point where she was going to quit. I also knew that she loved working at Zaba and needed the job. So I decided to come early and catch them doing this. Hidden in the supply cupboard next to our small kitchen, I readied my cell phone. As I expected, Kimberly arrived and started making coffee. A few minutes later, the four of them arrived, and the torment began. Hey, ball, grinned Ted, the leader, turning to Kimberly. Show us your tits. Fred, another of the four, added, I want to see your big fat ass. Yes, said the other two. We will even help you take off your clothes. I saw tears rolling down Kimberly's face, and I couldn't take it anymore. I had more than enough evidence, so I came out of the closet. You four, pack your things and leave. You're finished. You don't have the authority to fire us. Fred shot back. Mr. Sanders hired us, and he said only he could fire us. It's true, I said with an unpleasant smile on my face. However, I have evidence that you sexually assaulted Kimberly. So let me explain what your options are. You four can either resign immediately, or I will turn over this video to the police. So, the choice is yours. Either you resign, or I call the police. I'll give you 15 minutes to make a decision. You can even run to Jacob if you want, but I'm sure he's not going to put his ass on the line to protect you bastards. Fifteen minutes later, I had all four resignations and all four left. A look of complete relief and gratitude appeared on Kimberly's face. Kimberly? I called her to my table after all four of them had left. I'm sorry for what those four put you through. I should have acted sooner. If something like this happens again, promise me that you will come to me immediately. You are a wonderful person, and those four are just assholes. Kimberly let out a small sob and thanked me for protecting her. I told her it was part of my job, but I wasn't doing a very good job because she had to suffer for too long at the hands of those assholes. Mr. Arnold, you don't know how much this means to me, she said, holding back tears. I was going to quit but I didn't know what I would do without this job. I didn't know if I could find another job that was as good. 
Again, Kimberly, I'm so sorry you had to put up with this garbage. I see that you are upset. If you want to take a day off, I will make sure it does not count toward your personal days or sick leave. Thank you, Mr. Arnold, but I would rather be here at work. After that day, it seemed like Kimberly couldn't do enough for me. I tried to tell her that I was just doing my job, and he continued to insist that I wasn't doing a very good job because of what she went through. Of course, I was called into Jacob's office as soon as he found out that I had forced his programmers to quit. I want these programmers hired again, he demanded as soon as I crossed the threshold of his office. This won't happen, I said decisively. I have evidence that these four assholes sexually assaulted and abused an administrative assistant in our department. If you want to hire them back, go ahead. But I can guarantee that a lawsuit will be filed against all four of them, the parent company and you. I don't think your bosses will think too highly of this. Jacob looked at me, but then smiled and relented. He tried to pretend he didn't know all the details, but that evening I realized that he was lying. Carol came home and chided me for being an asshole to Jacob. She thought I was a jerk for threatening our boss. At that moment, I should have known what Jacob was up to because my gut screamed, danger. But when everything returned to normal at home, I brushed off the incident. At the end of the day, I still believed that Carol loved me and only me. If I had listened to my intuition, I might not be in prison now, but I was stupid and allowed Jacob and my wife to lull me into a false sense of well-being. And for two months after the merger, nothing changed between Carol and me. I found out that the company that acquired us was called Unity Software. They were about the same size as us, but they worked mostly on government contracts. Zaba gave them the opportunity to enter the commercial market. And no, Jacob's father did not own the company. His family's fortune was made in the production of pipes and wires. However, Jacob's father sold the business while Jacob was still in college. I could say a lot of nasty things about Jacob, but I can't say he's incompetent. In fact, he did a great job bringing the two companies together. In fact, he convinced the board of directors to keep the Zaba name because it had a better reputation. I didn't know that Jacob had completed his job of merging the two companies in eight weeks. After that, he began to seduce my gullible wife. Like Sandy at school, Jacob was able to win over Carol. Despite my warnings about him, Carol seemed fascinated by the asshole and kept talking about what a great job he was doing. I kept warning her about Jacob, but she just said, I was jealous. In her fourth month, Carol announced that she was pregnant. I was in seventh heaven. However, our sex life began to decline. From three times a week, it was reduced to once every two weeks. I put it down to Carol's pregnancy. Then our lunches together stopped, and finally Carol stopped commuting with me to work. The culmination of all this was the conversation. One morning, Carol stopped me before leaving for work. I was a little surprised to find that she was still at home, since lately she had been leaving at least an hour before me. Michael, we need to talk, she said, inviting me to sit on the sofa. I sat down as I was asked, not realizing that we had to discuss something so important early in the morning. However, what Carol told me rocked my whole world. I'm sorry to tell you this, Carol said, her eyes hard, but I fell in love with Jacob, and he fell in love with me. I looked at her for a long time. As I studied her face, I realized that she had no regrets. Finally, I exploded. Are you completely crazy? I told you Jacob is an asshole and he will try to drive a wedge between us. I can't believe you believe his complete crap. He's not an asshole. Carol flushed. He is a kind and loving person. He understands me, something you could never do. I felt my soul being destroyed with every word Carol said. At this point I was desperate, so I did what I hoped would bring her to her senses. What about our unborn child? I said softly. Doesn't this mean anything to you? The child is not yours, Carol answered with a forced smile. I was stunned by her statement. It's a lie. No, that's not true, she said. We didn't have sex for two weeks when I got pregnant. Now, I was beside myself with rage. You are a cheating bitch. You had sex with that piece of shit. This is my body and I can do whatever I want with it, she shouted at me. I don't belong to you. Devastation can't even begin to describe what I felt. 
but my father once told me to never show a woman that she hurt you. Maintaining my composure was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but I managed to pull myself together and grinned at her. You said that Jacob understands you in a way that I never understood. I laughed tightly. You're right. He understands. He understands that you are a stupid, gullible piece of trash. God, how stupid you are. But you know what? You deserve each other. He's a fucking asshole. And you're a fucking bitch. Fuck you, Michael, Carol raged. No, this will never happen again, I said calmly. But just so you know, I'm not moving out of this house. You can live with Jacob in his apartment. We'll see about that. Carol turned and headed to the bedroom. What a nightmare I found myself in. Finding out that my loving wife had been having sex with Jacob all this time was too much to bear. Jacob, on the other hand, gave me no doubt. I cried all the way to work, but eventually pulled myself together. Well, that's an outright lie. I ran from pure rage. Along the way, I decided that I would resign and beat the crap out of Jacob, but not necessarily in that order. And then he ran into Jacob as he walked through the company's front door. He didn't seem at all alarmed when he saw me and even grinned. The thought flashed through my mind that it would be very Carol-like to take charge and drop her little bomb on me without consulting Jacob. She was very independent. On the other hand, Jacob, as I suspected, had no intention of telling me about the baby before it was born. Then he would have taken away both my wife and my newly born child at the same time. This would be his final victory over me. Rage filled me as I approached him. He continued to grin. At that moment, I exploded and punched him in the nose and then in the mouth. Blood immediately started pouring down his face, but I wasn't finished. I gave him two strong blows to the groin, and when he began to fall apart, I hit him with an uppercut. Then I left him crumpled in front of the door as the guards rushed to help. I later learned that he had lost three teeth in addition to a broken nose. Not everything was all right with me either. I broke two fingers on my left hand. I headed to the bullpen and began collecting all my personal belongings and papers into a box. Kimberly saw me, and I saw the worry and fear on her face. What's happened? She was sincerely worried. Jacob seduced my wife behind my back, and now she's leaving me for him. I just beat the crap out of him, so I guess I'm fired. And even if they don't fire me, I will quit. The rest of the staff were shocked by what happened. My team was not only upset for me, but also very worried about their jobs. I assured them that my action would not affect their future work in any way. Once the staff were reassured and assured that they wouldn't get hurt because of my stupidity, I went back to packing my things. But before I could finish, the police arrived, and I was arrested. I expected this to be my destiny, but I didn't expect it to happen so soon. While I was being handcuffed, I asked Kimberly if she could pack up the remaining items and take them home with her. After I was photographed, fingerprinted, and given paper towels to dry my fingers, I was allowed to make a phone call. But I didn't know who to call. My parents were on a cruise. Besides, they lived 2,000 miles away in San Diego, and I lived in Nashville. I definitely wasn't going to call Carol. Finally, I decided to call Kimberly. Maybe she can find me a lawyer. However, when I called Zaba, the receptionist told me that Kimberly was gone for the day. After that, I didn't know what to do and just sat in my cell, alternately angry as hell and wondering how I could get my wife back. One thought kept running through my head. How could Carol betray me in such a cold and heartless way? Then the thought of revenge overshadowed all others. As the day wore on and I languished in prison, it became clear to me that Jacob already had a plan. My problems were just beginning. I know Jacob didn't expect the beating he received today. However, I was convinced that Jacob expected me to attack him as soon as I learned of his betrayal. Only he believed that he could do this at a time convenient for himself and in a convenient place. Looks like I ruined that part of his plan. About four o'clock in the afternoon, I appeared before the judge for my arraignment. I was assigned a public defender because I did not have a lawyer. To my horror, he looked like a teenager with a bad complexion. Not only did my lawyer look like a child, but he also seemed to know nothing about me or my case. He quickly tried to read the file when the judge started to get annoyed with him. Lawyer, the judge barked. It's very simple. Does your client plead guilty or not guilty? 
The guy looked at me like a deer in headlights. Then I jumped up and firmly stated, not guilty. Thank God, the judge sighed. Bail has been set at $2,500, cash or check. I didn't have nearly enough cash on me, and I didn't carry blank checks with me. So I looked up at the judge. Sorry, Your Honor, but I don't have that much cash, and I don't carry blank checks with me. Is there any way I can contact the guarantor? My secretary will help you with this, and she will let you know when the trial date is set, he said. But before he could name the next case, I heard a voice behind me. I'll post bail for him. I turned around to see Kimberly waving a checkbook. I was stunned to see her in the courtroom and very touched that she cared enough to come and help me. I'll give you your money back as soon as I can get to the ATM, I assured Kimberly. I'm not worried about it, she said softly, looking at my swollen hand. Hurts badly? In the grand scheme of things, this doesn't even compare to the pain of Carol's betrayal. For that matter, boss, Kimberly said, looking me in the eyes, I think your wife is a very stupid bitch. She made a huge mistake by trading you for Jacob. I smiled at my administrative assistant. Thank you, that's very kind of you. At that moment, the young man stepped towards me. Are you Michael Arnold? When I answered yes, he handed me an envelope and said, You've been served. I probably shouldn't have been surprised, but the speed with which I was handed the papers left no doubt that Jacob and Carol had been planning this for some time. It was another cut in my heart. Let's go get something to eat after I withdraw some money from the ATM, I said despondently. However, when I tried to log into my account, I was denied. I called the bank, and they told me that all my accounts were frozen. It will remain in effect until the court overturns it. Yes, now I know that you can file a petition with the court for relief from a complete asset freeze. But I didn't know that then. I also found out that my other savings account was frozen and my credit cards were canceled. A quick check of my wallet showed that I had $126 plus a $100 bill tucked into one of the folds. Apparently, Carol and Jacob froze all my money, I told Kimberly. I don't know exactly what I should do, but at least I can buy you dinner. No, don't buy it, Kimberly protested. You come to my apartment and I'll cook dinner for us. I had to admit that I liked Kimberly's suggestion. It didn't make sense for me to spend what little money I had on lunches. We stopped at Zaba, picked up my car, and I followed Kimberly to her apartment. I couldn't believe how helpful this woman was to me. After all, she was just a work colleague. I was going to pay her back every cent and more as soon as I got my finances sorted out. At dinner, I felt really bad. Not only that, but two of my fingers hurt like hell. I put ice on them as soon as I got to Kimberly, but they still hurt. After watching me writhe in pain, Kimberly finally pulled out a packet of Percocet she'd bought for a root canal. I took one tablet, and after half an hour, the pain subsided significantly. However, I was not in good company. They really did a trick on me, I complained. I'm completely spoiled, taped up and tattooed. Now I can't even think about revenge on Jacob or Carol, because it will come back to me like a boomerang. But someday, I'll pay these two bastards back in full. Mr. Arnold, Kimberly said softly. Please, call me Michael, I insisted. I'm not your boss anymore. Besides, what you did for me today makes you a very good friend. Kimberly smiled and continued. Michael, my mother cheated on my father and left him for another man. I had to live with her, and I hated every minute of it. Her lover was just as much of an asshole as Jacob. He never married my mother, but they lived together for ten years until he found someone younger to run away with. My father was embittered and tried to take revenge on my mother for many years. He was imprisoned several times and eventually died a broken man. Don't waste your life trying to get revenge. In the end, my father told me that he truly regretted letting my mother's betrayal ruin him. He would like to just move on and forget this bitch. Today, my mother lives alone in a nursing home where she has breathing problems due to years of smoking. I visit her once a week, although I still don't like her very much. And every week, I have to listen to her lament about what a mistake she made by leaving my father, so please don't waste your life seeking revenge. I told her she was probably right. However, at that moment I had no intention of letting those sneaky bastards off the hook. 
the anger was still bubbling under the surface, and I wanted my pound of flesh. After helping put away the dishes, I told Kimberly that I had to go and find a cheap motel. Her reaction was immediate. No, you won't do that. You will spend the night here. I have a spare bedroom, and you'll be glad to have it. Kimberly, you were the only ray of sunshine in the hole that became my life. I can't force myself on you anymore. First of all, this is not an imposition, she insisted. Secondly, if you sleep here, I can go to work tomorrow and find out what's going on. Again, Kimberly made a lot more sense than I did, so I accepted her invitation. Around mid-morning the next day, Kimberly called me to tell me that I had indeed been fired. She then told me to turn on her computer and type out an email instructing HR to send my latest check to her address. Surely, the head of human resources was not sure that the company was obligated to pay for my vacation and sick leave, but she believed that this still needed to be indicated in the letter. But after all, the courts froze all my money, I pointed out. Shirley told me the court order only applies to bank accounts. So write the letter as quickly as possible before Jacob or Carol realize what you're doing. After doing as Kimberly suggested, I received a fax stating that in a couple of days, I would receive a check for $4,125.57. The fax also stated that they should check state law to determine if the company must pay vacation pay or sick leave. As it turns out, no. Nevertheless, getting almost 5000 was a great success. When Kimberly got home, she told me that Jacob wasn't there that day, but Carol was, and she was mad at me for ruining her relationship with her boyfriend. For some reason, this amused both Kimberly and me. I decided to stay at Kimberly's until I received my check. During this time, I compiled a resume and began actively looking for work. Very quickly, I discovered that Jacob and Carol had blacklisted me. Since I worked in cybersecurity, no one would take a chance on me having a felony conviction. When the check arrived, I gave it to Kimberly and she deposited it into her account. I didn't want to risk opening a new account and have it frozen too. When I told Kimberly again that I wanted to get rid of her worries and rent my own apartment, she was upset. Kimberly pointed out that without a checking account, I probably wouldn't even be able to rent a doghouse. In addition, if they checked my credit rating now, it would most likely show my financial difficulties. Listen, please stay here until you find a new job, she convinced me. In the meantime, you can find a lawyer. In the end, I agreed. The lawyer I hired took on my case after I paid him a down payment of $2,000. However, it was money well spent because he immediately petitioned the court to allow me access to a reasonable amount of money from our checking and savings accounts. The court allowed me to spend an amount sufficient to provide a minimum lifestyle. This, of course, included my lawyer's fees. I had been living in Kimberly's apartment for eight days and decided it was time to leave. So I found an apartment in her complex and paid the required deposit for it. That Saturday, Kimberly helped me buy minimal furniture for my new apartment. At the same time, I invited her to dinner, which I promised her. Kimberly wanted to go to the Olive Garden, which I also love. During dinner, I studied her carefully. She had an angelic face, but the extra 50 pounds she carried detracted from that beauty. And I could tell that Kimberly was very self-conscious about her weight. Then I had an idea that I hoped she wouldn't find offensive. I turned it over in my head, deciding how best to present this proposal. I just found out that there is a gym in our complex, I said casually. I want to use it, but I would really like to have someone to go with. You're interested? Do you really want to be seen with me? She asked, moving her hands up and down her sides, pointing out her extra weight. Yes, I want to, I answered readily. Unless you prefer not to be seen with a potential criminal. My comment got exactly the reaction I wanted. Kimberly really didn't want to go to the gym because she didn't want anyone to see her body. However, Kimberly did not want to offend me at all. So she agreed. We made a schedule where we went four times a week at six in the morning because there was never anyone there. After the first week, Kimberly realized she didn't have to worry about being embarrassed and began to enjoy the sessions. I continued to look for work, but no one in the security software industry was interested in me, at least until a decision was made in my case. In a conversation with a lawyer, I found out that there was a high probability that I would be found guilty of assault. However, he was careful. He never told me what to say or lie, 
However, he told me that if I had gone into a blind rage because of my boss and wife's infidelity, that could be a mitigating factor. And if I cannot remember what actually happened, the court, of course, will have to take that into account. On the day of the trial, Kimberly took time off from work and came with me. I really appreciated this support. When my lawyer learned that Judge Parker would be the presiding judge, he convinced me to request a closed court hearing. In this case, the judge makes the decision, not the jury. My lawyer explained that this would make the judge happy. And besides, Judge Parker hates cheaters. The prosecutor presented three witnesses to the alleged attack. They talked about what they saw and heard. My lawyer cross-examined them, forcing them to admit that they did not see the fight start or hear me threaten Jacob. They couldn't even say categorically that Mr. Sanders didn't throw the first punch. Jacob was then called to the stand where he told his story. Naturally, Jacob went into detail about what was described as an unprovoked attack. Jacob categorically claimed that he did not throw a single blow and then listed the injuries he received. My lawyer asked him a question about his relationship with my wife. Jacob lied and said they were just friends. When asked about the child my wife was carrying, he told the judge that, as far as he knew, it was mine. When Jacob left the podium, he grinned at me as he returned to his seat. I was the only witness the lawyer called for my defense. And all he did was ask me to describe what happened that day, leading up to the alleged attack, and what I remember about the incident. I told her how my wife had surprised me this morning by telling me she was divorcing me so she could marry my boss. I was especially shocked when my wife told me that the child I thought was my own was actually Jacob's. I explained that she was the love of my life, but she threw me away like an old pair of shoes. I then told the judge that I remember seeing Jacob at the door and him smirking at me. After that, I lied and said I didn't remember anything until I was at my desk throwing things into a box. The prosecutor tried to confuse me with my memories. He kept trying to revise the chronology of events. The truth was that I was so furious that morning that I had no idea of the time. And the more he questioned me and tried to get me to indicate specific times and actions, the more obvious it became that I did not remember anything. He then asked me if I really thought the court would believe that I had no memory of the attack. I told him that on the way to work I had a headache and saw flashes of light, which was actually true. I repeated that all I remember was Jacob smirking at me. He then asked me if I knew for sure that the child my wife was carrying was Jacob's. I told him that all I could tell him was what my wife said. Carol was not in court because no one bothered to subpoena her. My lawyer told me that he thought my wife would be a wild card that he didn't want to touch. I believe the prosecutor felt the same way. After my speech, the judge retired to his chambers to consider the verdict, but returned ten minutes later. It is clear to me, said Judge Parker, that Mr. Arnold was betrayed in the most cowardly and shameful manner. I believe that this blow to his nervous system led to serious mental disorders. I believe that Mr. Arnold was temporarily insane, and therefore I find him not guilty. It's outrageous, Jacob growled from his seat, causing Judge Parker to slam his gavel down hard, threatening to hold Jacob accountable for contempt of court. The sight of Jacob, his face red with anger, made me happy. Jacob's victory over me just took a small hit. However, I wanted to take revenge on him so badly. However, having just avoided jail time, I had to put any thoughts of revenge on hold for the foreseeable future. Besides, I had no idea how to hit them back. Outside the courtroom, Jacob was waiting for me. The thought came to me to try to push him to attack me. But I wasn't sure how this would turn out, so I just called the bailiff. I shouldn't be closer than 150 meters from this man, but he's stopping me from leaving. The bailiff looked at Jacob and told him to move on. Jacob shouted over his shoulder, This is not the end yet. I'm going to sue you. This bothered me, so I asked my lawyer, Yes, can he sue me? Any person can sue anyone else, he smiled, but his case is weak. But if you really want to pull the rug out from under him, don't accept anything other than an offer to pay for his medical expenses that weren't covered by insurance. I did so in a letter addressed to his office. Jacob did not respond or file a lawsuit. 
The evening after the trial, it had been just over nine weeks since Carol dropped that bombshell on me. Although I was still seething with hatred, the victory in court lifted my spirits a little, and I decided to invite Kimberly to dinner. I also had some exciting news to share with her. Kimberly and I agreed to meet at a small Italian restaurant. That evening, she had to work a little later because things weren't going well in my old department. Nothing serious. They were just getting used to my absence. Anyway, when she arrived, she looked great. Kimberly was still overweight, but it was obvious that she had lost weight, and the dress she wore was very flattering. I stood up and kissed her on the cheek. Wow, you look great. You've lost weight, haven't you? Kimberly beamed. Yes, I lost 15 pounds. Sorry I didn't notice earlier, but you're wearing those oversized sweatshirts and sweatpants. Anyway, like I said, you look great. The restaurant was small and cozy. This was exactly the place that couples choose for a date. But I didn't think of it as a date. It was just a meeting between two close friends. I asked you to have dinner with me today because I wanted to celebrate my victory in court, and I have news. I found a job. This is wonderful, Kimberly rejoiced. Who will you work for? Sable Security from Jacksonville, Florida, I answered. I didn't know they had an office here, Kimberly said with concern. No, I'll have to move to Jacksonville. And he was completely surprised when the light went out in Kimberly's eyes and tears began to roll down her cheeks. Actually, I thought you'd be happy for me, I said, confused. I'm glad you got a job. Kimberly said as the tears continued to flow, but you'll be 600 miles away from me. Kimberly, remember you told me not to let my wife's betrayal consume me with hatred? She nodded. Now I understand that the only way to do this is to put some distance between Carol and me and let time do the rest. I understand, Kimberly said, wiping her eyes. I'll just miss you. I really enjoyed having a friend. Hey, I'm just a phone call away, I said trying unsuccessfully to cheer her up. I was really surprised by Kimberly's reaction. Then it dawned on me that she probably didn't have many friends, so I made another offer. You could come and visit me if you want. I don't know what Jacksonville has to offer, but I'll find out. Do you really want me to come visit? She asked. Of course, I answered quickly. Remember, I won't have friends there either. When are you leaving? Kimberly finally asked. I'm leaving only in 45 days, but before that time, I have a lot to do. I need to find housing, open a new bank account. I also need to take a lie detector test, get fingerprinted, and pass other tests. I think it will take at least two trips there to get it all done. After this, my mood improved somewhat, but I noticed that Kimberly was not eating much. I figured she was still a little upset. In fact, the closer the time came for me to leave, the sadder Kimberly became every day. She seemed to be hoping for something more between us. I have to admit, this confused me because I felt that Kimberly could do a much better job than I could. I spent my last evening before starting my new job in Kimberly's apartment. She prepared a delicious dinner, which was complemented by a chocolate cake with the inscription, I'll miss you. After I helped her clean up, we watched TV until it was time for bed. I kissed her on the lips before heading to the guest room. At night, I felt the bed move slightly, and someone's body slid next to me. Still half asleep, I realized it was Kimberly, and she was naked. As quickly as I could, I pulled off my panties and lifted my T-shirt over my head. When I turned to face Kimberly, she pressed herself against my body, and I felt her silky, smooth skin. Her soft breasts pressed against my chest, and it all felt wonderful. I kissed her on the lips, and she responded with desperate passion. When I clung to Kimberly, she sobbed. I started to worry that maybe I had hurt her, or she was angry that I took advantage of her, or something like that. What happened, Kimberly? I asked, almost in a panic. Did I offend you? No, I'm just so happy, Kimberly said, laying her head on my chest. I've already had sex with five or six men, but this is the first time I've made love. Thank you. We lay there for several long minutes before Kimberly slid off my bed. She took two steps towards the door and then came back to me. She leaned over and kissed me. Will you sleep with me in my bed tonight? I happily agreed, if only because my bed was completely wet. 
Besides, sleeping with Kimberly seemed like the perfect way to spend my last night in this city. After breakfast, I checked my car one last time to make sure I had everything. Then I turned to Kimberly and kissed her. She responded with perhaps the most passionate kiss I've ever received. Then, unfortunately, it was time for me to leave. As my car pulled away, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw Kimberly sitting on the side of the road. She buried her head in her hands and sobbed. I desperately didn't want to leave her, but I knew it was best this way. I still loved Carol and was therefore damaged goods, but it was even funny because I no longer thought about revenge. Just deep down, I had a deep sadness. Jacksonville was an interesting city, but I didn't get to see much of it. I threw myself into my new job. I worked long hours, not just to make up for lost time, but because it helped me forget about Carol. I kept in touch with Kimberly, and she always seemed so happy when she heard from me, and so sad when our phone conversation ended. It was from her that I heard the news that I was so afraid of. Carol and Jacob got married about a month after their divorce was finalized. I also learned that Carol had a baby girl. For some reason, this news didn't excite me as much. Perhaps I was beginning to overcome the resentment and humiliation. True, I no longer had sleepless nights. I also rarely woke up in the morning depressed because Carol wasn't there in bed next to me. In March, Kimberly came and spent four days with me. Since we hadn't seen each other for a while, we weren't sure about our relationship. We kind of danced around the issue of sex and didn't sleep together until the last two nights. It was almost as intense as that first time. Only this time, I had rubber bands on hand. About a year after that, I was told that I could hire an administrative assistant for my team. Sable Security was significantly larger than my old company. While Zaba had one team dedicated to cybersecurity, we had six. And over this year, I went from being a simple member of one team to its leader. Since the decision about who to hire was mine, I immediately called Kimberly. I barely had time to explain the job to her before she said she wanted it. When I met Kimberly at the airport, my breath caught. As I expected, she was great. When she got out of the passenger compartment, I saw the men's heads shoot up, but all she wanted was to get to me. She threw herself into my arms and kissed me with such passion that my knees went weak. The plan was for Kimberly to stay with me until she found her own apartment. I thought it would only take a week, but the search lasted for weeks. There was something wrong with every apartment she looked at. I didn't complain, because Kimberly and I slept in the same bed. It's funny that during the year and a half that I lived in Jacksonville, I thought about Carol less and less. And when Kimberly appeared, I stopped thinking about her altogether. However, I knew that Kimberly would eventually move, and I was dreading that day. Five weeks later, I asked Kimberly about her apartment situation and she started crying. I was completely dumbfounded. I knew I made her cry, but I didn't understand why. I'm really sorry, I apologized. Did I say something wrong? Do you want me to leave? Kimberly asked timidly. Hell no, I said decisively. I would like you to stay forever but I understand that one day you will want to leave. I need time to get ready. I would ask you to marry me, but you are too good for me. No, that's not true, Kimberly protested. I've loved you almost from the day I started working at Zaba. I would marry you in a heartbeat. This changed everything for us. That same day, we went ring shopping and started planning our wedding. Although I was afraid that Kimberly would eventually leave me for someone else, I was so in love with her that I had to take the risk. Six months later, Kimberly and I got married. A year after that, Kimberly gave birth to a little boy whom we named Mikey Jr. Eighteen months after that, we had a girl named Charlotte. I moved up at Sable to lead all eight cybersecurity teams. Yes, we have added two more. Kimberly, on the other hand, chose to stay home. Around Christmas three years later, I was called into a meeting. At this meeting, I learned that Sable was planning to acquire Zaba security software. I was to be part of a team that would conduct due diligence before the acquisition was completed. During the years that Kimberly and I were married, Kimberly's mother died and my parents retired. They moved to Jacksonville to be closer to their grandchildren and me. Taking them on as babysitters, 
I planned to use the week-long trip as a mini-vacation. I also wanted to use Kimberly's skills as an administrative assistant to help me conduct my investigation. This way, I could take Kimberly to work with me every day, where she could see some of the people she worked with, and we could sneak away for long lunches together. During my week in Nashville, I learned four things. First, I learned that this facility was the only place Zaba did cybersecurity. Second, Jacob was promoted to Chief Operating Officer and Carol to Senior Project Manager. Third, despite my dislike of Jacob, I found him to be an excellent manager of the company. From my point of view, all his activities were first class. And the last thing I knew was that Zaba was having their Christmas party on Friday night and I had to go to it. Other than our team's initial introductions to Jacob, I had no contact with him. Also, during the entire week, I didn't see Carol once. However, everything changed at the Christmas party. Zaba rented a ballroom at the Hilton Doubletree in downtown Nashville. It was festively decorated, tables lined the dance floor, and a group of five people sat in one of the corners. They played soft Christmas carols, soft background music, and, from time to time, played old songs. After dinner and speeches, dancing was to take place. There was also a bar open, much to everyone's delight, and he attracted more and more attention as more people arrived. Jacob, Carol, and some of Zaba's senior staff were there to greet the Sable team. I wasn't looking forward to it. I didn't know how I would react to having to face Jacob and Carol. However, my fears were in vain. Jacob, I already knew, looked about the same, and Carol, although looking a little older, was still good-looking. Strangely, I didn't feel anything when they came to greet us. Mike, I'm glad you were able to join us tonight, Jacob said nervously. I hope our past disagreements will not interfere with the acquisition. Not from me, I assured him. This is ancient history. And who is this beauty? Jacob smiled widely, taking Kimberly's hand. This is my beloved wife, Kimberly, I said, kissing her on the cheek. Jacob's smile fell as he looked at Kimberly and then at me. Kimberly smirked at Jacob. Don't you remember me, Jacob? I was Michael's administrative assistant when he worked at Zaba, but I changed my job and became Michael's wife. This was a huge promotion for me. Jacob's eyes narrowed even more, but he tried to smile again. However, she didn't seem sincere. Of course, so much time has passed. Sorry I didn't recognize you. Jacob moved on, but his gaze continued to wander over Kimberly and me. Then Carol moved closer to me. Michael, you look very good, she said, taking my hand. And your wife is gorgeous. I didn't know you got married. We will be married for seven years in March, Kimberly said with a smile, hugging my hand. Both you and Jacob look good. I replied and then asked, How is your daughter doing? Carol winced at first, but then smiled. She's doing great. Tammy is in second grade and her brother, Jacob Jr., is in kindergarten. Do you have children? Two, Kimberly answered. Mickey Jr. goes to kindergarten, and Charlotte is still at home with me. They are both doing well. Thank you for asking. After that, Carol moved on and soon after, Kimberly and I walked away to find our table. The food was excellent, and the speeches were fortunately short. Sable's CEO simply reassured everyone that no one's job was in jeopardy, at least for the next year, and that he was looking forward to the merger. When dinner was over, the music started, and Kimberly and I did a few laps around the stage. I think today's young people have missed the boat when it comes to dancing. Slow dancing with your loved one is such an intimate thing. It can connect two people in much the same way that sex can. One evening, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned around and saw Carol standing there. Kimberly turned to see who I was looking at, and her eyes narrowed as she realized it was my ex-wife. Carol smiled sweetly at Kimberly. Can I ask your husband to dance? Kimberly looked at me and then smiled at Carol. Only if you remember where to return it. I took Carol out onto the dance floor, and we danced in silence for about a minute. Michelle, I just want to apologize to you for what Jacob and I did back then, she said, with sincere remorse in her voice. 
you didn't deserve any of this. But when I found out that I was pregnant with Jacob's child, I realized that everything was over between us. Therefore, I decided to make our breakup quick and simple. I didn't even think about how painful it would be for you. I shouldn't have let Jacob talk me into the scorched earth policy we were using. This was completely inappropriate. I laughed a little. As people say, it's either water under the bridge or water over the dam. Now it doesn't matter. We all moved on. Besides, I kind of got something out of it. I beat the crap out of Jacob. Apparently, I didn't do much damage to his testicles because you had a second child. Carol giggled at this. We danced a little in silence, and I decided to bury the hatchet between us once and for all. Listen, Carol, I began hesitantly. I admit, I was very sad when you left me for Jacob. It took me many months to come to terms with your loss, but now we are both happily married and have children. I believed that this was meant to happen. Carol burst out laughing, and when I looked at her face, a tear was running down her cheek. Did I say something wrong? Carol just shook her head. No, Michael, you didn't say anything bad. It's just not what you think. At first glance, everyone thinks that we are the perfect couple. And in the first year, I would have agreed with them. But Jacob is just a charming manipulator. He uses people and then discards them. I know he cheated on me many times, but he is not as smart as he thinks. Every time I find out he cheated on me, I cheat on him. My mouth opened and Carol noticed it. She giggled. It's a hell of a way to live, I know, she said sadly. I should have left Jacob when I found out what he really was like, but I was too ashamed and I was too proud. Michael, I'm glad you found happiness, but I will always regret leaving you. You and my children are the best thing that ever happened to me. We continued talking until the song ended. Carol then walked me back to my table and thanked Kimberly for letting her borrow me. As Kimberly and I danced our last dance that evening, it dawned on me that her advice years ago had been proven correct. If I refused to move on from Carol, she could very well be my undoing. It's probably true what they say. When God closes one door, he opens another. When I lost Carol, I was completely devastated. But then God allowed me to find Kimberly. And I can't even imagine life without her. So, what did you and Carol talk about? Kimberly finally asked. Is she trying to win you back? I laughed and kissed her. As if she has any chance of doing this. Okay, Kimberly said, resting her head on my shoulder. Just remember that I am a Gelo's woman. I'll tear off your you-know-what if you ever try to leave me. And she only brought it up because she heard that not everything was rosy and sunny in their marriage. Carol told me the same thing, I agreed, but I think they will stay together for the sake of the children. Once the kids are grown, I wouldn't bet on this marriage surviving. What a sad way to live your life. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.